This evening we are looking at the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. But rather than just simply read that text, which I've already quoted for you, I'd like to read for you an example of the breaking of that commandment. Uh, we've already seen uh, in our call to worship the prayer that David prayed to the Lord, asking for his mercy and forgiveness to deliver him from blood guiltiness. Uh, that was because of what his adultery actually ended in, which was his having Uriah the Hittite, which was Bathsheba's husband, put to death in order to cover over his sin. So that was his prayer repentance. Let's read in 2 Samuel chapter 11 the actual event and perhaps try to learn something from this as to how it happened and how we might avoid the same thing. 2 Samuel chapter 11. I'm going to read the, uh, the entire chapter. Then it happened in the spring at the time when kings go out to battle. that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the sons of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he lay with her. When she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. The woman conceived and she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. And David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked concerning the welfare of Joab and the people in the state of the war. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of the king's house and a present from the king was sent out after him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. Now when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Have you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. Then David said to Uriah, stay here today also and tomorrow I will let you go. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now David called him and he ate and drank before him and he made him drunk. And in the evening he went out to lie on his bed with his Lord's servants, but he did not go down to his house. Now in the morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. He had written in the letter saying, place Uriah in the front line of the fiercest battle and withdraw from him so that he may be struck down and die. So it was as Joab kept watch on the city that he put Uriah at the place where he knew there were valiant men. The men of the city went out and fought against Joab and some of the people among David's servants fell and Uriah the Hittite also died. Then Joab sent and reported to David all the events of the war. He charged the messenger saying, when you have finished telling all the events of the war to the king, and if it happens that the king's wrath rises and he says to you, why did you go so near to the city to fight? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck down Abimelech, the son of Jerobesheth? Did not a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Thebes? Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger departed and came and reported to David all that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, the men prevailed against us and came out against us in the field, but we pressed them as far as the entrance of the gate. Moreover, the archer shot at your servants from the wall, so some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. Then David said to the, to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Make your battle against the city stronger and overthrow it and so encourage him. Now when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she mourned for her, her husband. 
When the time of mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife. Then she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. And you know, that was, of course, two things. The fact that he lusted after his neighbor's wife, he, to the point where he committed adultery, not just with his mind, but also in action. And to try to cover over his sin, he had um, Bathsheba's husband put to death so that he might uh, take her as well. Now, the question we want to ask this evening is, how can we avoid doing the same kind of thing? How can we protect one another's purity? Well, that's what we want to consider for a few moments. Now, again, remember, Jesus tells us that we need to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts and mind and soul and strength. He also tells us that we need to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But, but how are we to do this? Uh, each person seems to have in their own mind what they believe would be the best way to do this. But God has His own way. And of course, His way is best. And if you love Him, this is what you need to do. You need to do it His way, including how we are to love or how you and I are to love one another. Now, we've seen so far that loving others means that we need, first of all, to respect the authority that God places in every sphere, in the state, in the church, and in the home. We saw, secondly, that the Lord would have us in loving others to protect their lives, Uh, not only in our actions, but also in those things that lead to those actions. And I'm thinking there primarily, the Lord would have us not only, of course, not to, to murder somebody not to to do anything that would tend toward injuring them, but to make sure that we never harbor any thoughts, any desires for, you know, hurting somebody else, injuring them, uh, any words that we might use that would do the same, anything that would lead up to that. This evening, we want to see the same holds true with regard to protecting each other's purity. In other words, not only uh, do we want to avoid the actions, but we want to avoid everything that leads up to those actions. And I think that this is particularly relevant, I think you would agree with me, in today's world. It seems like the Western culture has become so fixated on, uh, if you will pardon this word because I can't think of any way around it, on sex. Sex is a very powerful thing. As you know, everywhere you look, everything is marketed by it. Put a pretty girl next to it uh, with some revealing clothing on it. It draws your attention. It sells things. It is, as you know, so desirable that our culture, virtually everybody in it, seems intent on getting as much of it as they possibly can. Now, we do know this is something that God created, something He created to be good, something that He actually created to be enjoyed but only in the context of marriage. I think his ultimate intention is that it may bring forth children and that those children, ideally, would be raised in the ways of the Lord. Of course, our society's failure to do this has resulted in the problems that we see, of course, not only with regard to marriage, but also with regard to the rearing of children. Now, one thing I think we need to make sure we don't forget is that marriage was originally created primarily uh, for companionship. It was not good for the man to be alone. God created a woman, one corresponding to his needs, and he brought to the man that she might be with him and that she might be his companion and his helpmate. Um, The Lord in that context also gave what we might call the act of marriage to be a blessing within that context. But the one thing we need to be careful, even in marriage, is to make sure that we don't replace what God really intends for the marriage relationship to be with this one act, because it can destroy the relationship. And considering, you know, as you you look at what it is that causes all the broken marriages that we see today, particularly among those who have the opportunity to switch spouses almost as quickly as they switch, as it were, their clothing or they don't even bother to marry anymore, they just go from one relationship to another, when it ceases to be fun because of this one particular act, they no longer care 
about one another. But that's not what marriage is supposed to be. So we do need to protect, of course, the idea of marriage, what it was intended to be, and that we don't allow this one blessing within marriage to, well, to destroy a marriage ultimately because it ceases to be what we hoped it would be. And we particularly need to make sure that we protect that one act by keeping it in marriage. Now, in light of these things, we want to ask the question this evening, how can we do that? Particularly, how can we protect our purity? And how can we protect our neighbor's purity? Well, I want us to consider a couple of things. First of all, why it is we need to do this. But more importantly, I think, how we can do this. Why, when you ask the question, why is it important that we do this, there's a lot of answers to that question. The primary one is because that's what God commands. He tells us that we are not to commit adultery. He tells us that we are to keep the act of marriage within marriage and not outside of marriage. But sometimes we might ask the question again, why does God command that? Where is the reasonableness of this? Some people would say it's very unreasonable. Why not just you know, freely uh, be with anyone we want to be and do whatever we want to do? Well, again, I think there is, of course, good reason why we do this, not the least of which God commands it. But even if we didn't understand it, we still would need to do it knowing that it's good. Thankfully, in this case, it's not like Luther said. You know, if God told me to, to eat the dung off the street, I would eat it and know it's good for me. Uh, that would be unreasonable from our perspective, I think. But I understand, of course, what Luther was, was meaning behind that. But in this case, I think there are good reasons. God knows it's for our good. He knows that the desire for these things has the potential, especially when it's shared with someone, to create very strong relational bonds, which something, really it's something that outside of marriage is not a good thing. It causes hearts to become knit together. And if the marriage covenant isn't there, that is not good. To fall into the sin can result in, of course, children outside the context of marriage, but we, we know through a great deal of experience a great deal of study, children, in order to be healthy, must be raised in a stable family. They need a father and a mother to be balanced and to be healthy. This is also something, as you know, that's extremely addicting and has the potential to create basically idolatry. Uh, we make idols out of just about everything. And of course, this is perhaps the greatest idol of our nation. And, of course, because our Lord tells us it's right that a man and a woman pair off, that there just be one man, one woman in a marriage relationship for life and that they stay married for life and that they don't introduce others into that relationship. Now, we do know that's, that there are exceptions to that rule as far as one man, one woman for life. And those exceptions either have to do with sin or with death. The Bible does say that there is divorce for biblical grounds, and those grounds are adultery or desertion. And we also know that death will end a marriage. If our spouse dies, we may marry again, but only in the Lord, only a believer. And of course, when we marry to begin with, it must be only with a believer. Now, again, for these reasons, the Lord specifically in this command forbids these relations outside of marriage. And He warns that those who are sexually impure, as we've already seen in our meditation, will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Let me just again remind you of this. He says, or do you not know? that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. I want you to notice that the very beginning of that list, how many of these are sexual sins. He mentions fornication. It's basically an immoral relationship between two unmarried individuals, a man and a woman. 
adultery, which is those relations with someone other than your spouse or, if you're not married, with somebody else's spouse. Uh, the effeminate basically refers to a man who behaves as a woman in a homosexual relationship and homosexuals refer to the man who behaves as a man in, with another man in a homosexual relationship with the other one being the more effeminate. You know, it's interesting that uh, the, Paul groups idolater in the middle of this, and I wonder if Paul didn't have in mind the idea that even in his day, sex has basically became an idol. It's not just something that's become prevalent in this age. It's something that has plagued just about every age. Now, if we ask the question, is this true just of these sins? Are these the only sins that will exclude you from the kingdom of heaven? No. Every sin will exclude you. The wages of sin is death. Any sin not repented of will destroy you. So Paul isn't just you know, giving us a comprehensive list here, but he is telling us definitively that these will exclude us as well as others. Does that mean, or is Paul telling us here, that if you've committed these sins, there's no hope for you? No, because we know that if you repent and trust in the Lord, there is hope, there is forgiveness, there is mercy. Otherwise, Paul would not be able to write, as he does in verse 11, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified but you were justified in the name of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. I want you to notice, I think he means that there were those engaged in all the sins that were in that list. They were like that, but they are no longer. You know, we often hear today that certain sins basically are, uh, you're born with it, you're born with the desire. And I don't doubt, I mean, we're born with sin, so we're born with the desire for many sinful things, but the Lord can break that bondage in every single one of them by the Holy Spirit, and He can cleanse us of those sins through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is hope for all. So He will forgive, He will cleanse if we simply turn to Him in faith. Nor is Paul really meaning to say here that if you're tempted by these things that you won't inherit the kingdom because all of us are tempted in a variety of ways. It's not a sin to be tempted, but it is a sin to fall to that temptation. Let's not forget that when Paul is talking about these things and any sins, he's not just referring to the actions. He's also referring to those things that lead up to the actions, things that we think, our imaginations, our desires, our words. The commandments of God control all of these things. So again, this is what the commandment is forbidding. It is forbidding uh, sexual immorality and impurity in action, in thoughts, in desires, and in words. Now that being the case, realizing that these things are sinful, we do want to make sure that we don't fall into them. And we also want to make sure that we don't cause others to fall into these things and that we don't contribute to it in any way. So we get to the second question. How can we protect ourselves? How can we protect others from these sins? Well, again, first of all, there's the obvious applications. Don't commit sexual sin outside of marriage. You know, don't allow that action. Don't do anything that leads to that act. If you don't have the gift of contentment, the Bible says, then you need to seek a spouse. If you're married, keep yourself only for your spouse. Cultivate relationship, a, a good, strong relationship with that spouse in all areas of your marriage, not just what we might call the act of marriage. Be true companions and helpers to one another. But again, there are those other things that contribute and lead up to these actions that I think sometimes we become uh, almost oblivious to the fact that they're there because we are so steeped in an impure culture that has gone sex crazy that we don't even think that, you know, that we, we might be doing something that might be provoking 
somebody else to sin. So we do need to consider this, and I want us just to consider two things under this point. How do we protect others? Well, we don't provoke impure thoughts in other people. We need to be careful with what we do. And then with regard to ourselves, how do we protect ourselves? Well, do not allow impure thoughts, try to, try to keep them from coming into your mind, but once they're in your mind, do not uh, entertain them. In other words, don't allow them to stay there and build up in your imaginations. Well, let's look at the, uh, the first point. Don't provoke impure thoughts in others. And you know what? That is something that we can do and perhaps something that we do, okay? So we need to be careful. Well, how is it that we can do this? I was thinking about this and realized that I, I do believe that everything that ultimately affects our heart has to come into our minds first. And in order to get into our minds, it has to come through our senses because our senses are the only roads that lead to our minds. So I was thinking about the various senses that we have and the various ways that those senses can actually convey information that shouldn't be conveyed. And I think I can take out the five senses that we have, I think at least four of them can be those inroads. You know, all the stuff, all the ideas are going to come through this way, so we need to make sure that we don't communicate through these senses to other people things that are going to stumble them. Well, what are some of those ways? And again, I think those of us who are older know that these things are true. Uh, those of you who are younger may not be convinced yet, but listen because this is the way it is. How do we convey ideas that might lead somebody into sexual sin? One way we do it is through touch, right? We can't, we got to make sure that we don't get too close to somebody else. Now, in marriage, again, okay, marriage, that's fine, that's where it's supposed to be, but outside of marriage, I'm talking about here. Touch is very stimulating. I think perhaps the young ladies here, um, some of the young men, I'm not sure would be the case, but some of the young ladies don't really understand how stimulating touch is to young men. Young men like to be touched by young women, but they, they shouldn't be because that kind of contact can stimulate, right? Stimulate. All of us have something that I think perhaps some of us wish we didn't have, but we do have as a part of our character. They're called hormones. And those hormones actually give us a desire for the things we're talking about here, for sexual uh, contact. It's something we wish we had more control over, but we don't. There are certain things that stimulate those hormones in men and women. One of those things is, of course, through touch. We need to make sure that as we touch one another that we don't basically provide stimulation that is going to tempt us in this way. Now, how can we do that? We need to maintain distance from one another. We need to um, respect one another's personal space. We need to limit or perhaps even eliminate certain forms of contact, such as hugging. And these are different things that will, will stimulate these desires. Hugging, holding hands, touching one's legs, waist, shoulders, kissing. All of these things basically stimulate the desire for sexual things. Now, you might say, I don't want to listen to that because I like that. I enjoy that kind of thing because it's fun. Well, the reason why it's fun is because it is stimulating. But you do need to realize that it is like pouring gasoline on a fire. And once the fire gets strong enough, you're not going to be able to stop it. Now, the wisest man who ever lived, besides our Lord Jesus Christ, was writing in the context of sexual immorality. He says this, Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? If you can do this, then yes, you can resist that kind of stimulation. But most men perhaps maybe all to a certain extent, cannot. If you play with fire, you're going to get burned. 
Touching is one way that stimulates the desire for sexual things. Hearing is another sense that will communicate those ideas into the mind of someone else. You, if you're going to protect someone else, need to be careful what you say. You know what it means to flirt, right? Flirting can be, again, gestures. It, it can be various motions and so forth, but particularly language, suggestive language, even just sort of teasing and playing around. You need to make sure that you don't put impure ideas in the minds of others by the things you say. Uh, oddly enough, although maybe not so odd, smell. Smell can do the same thing. We need to be careful what we wear and why we wear the different scents that we wear. Um, I think young men will tell you that um, there are certain types of perfume that women can wear that is very stimulating and can create that kind of desire. Uh, you know, as you know, something that smells horrible doesn't do that. Something that smells very good can do that. So that's another area to be careful in. But the area, I think, perhaps above all, that we need to be careful of, because this is one of the things that starts it, is sight. We need to be careful how we stimulate one another with regard to what we're wearing. Now, what, what do I mean by this? Well, I'll just put it bluntly. The more skin that is showing, the more desire it will provoke. You know, I think even our, our godless society understands that this is the case, which why even to this day they're, they're not as, um, well, they're not as bad as they could possibly be. You know, as, as, as a young man growing up in high school, hearing, you know, about certain places in the world where, you know, clothes were kind of an optional thing, I was thinking, how long is it going to be before our society actually becomes that way? Well, I thought for sure it would be that way in my day, and it still hasn't actually happened up to this point from the time that I was a teenager up till now, but the question you might ask is, why not? Well, I think it's because even the world understands that there are certain limits, although those limits are growing increasingly small, they know that too much temptation is not a good thing. If clothes were optional, sexual crimes would skyrocket beyond what they are already, and they are bad already. As a matter of fact, we just saw a report of what's happening in the military. Sexual abuse is, is skyrocketing. Uh, not only are the women being abused by men, but men are being abused by men. It's rampant. We become a sex-crazed society. Well, what if clothes were optional? It would make it far worse. We'd be even more obsessed with this than we are already now. And really, I don't think, I think it would bring society to a standstill because nobody would be able to do anything any longer. They'd be too fixated on what's going on around them. Well, as I've said, considering that example, I think you can understand desire increases relative to how much skin is being revealed, as well as how attractive that skin might be, and decreases relative to how much is not showing, especially as you will, I think, recognize in particular areas. There's areas that are even more provocative than others. And of course, with regard to particular genders. Just ask any man, young or old, whether or not the, the revealing of certain areas of the body provokes desire. It's true. It's real. And we need to take that into account. So we need to be careful that we don't stumble other people, that we don't provoke lustful thoughts in their minds. Uh, as we think about what we would wear, for instance, we need to understand that comfort is not the main concern. Whether or not we're fashionable, is not the main concern. Whether or not we're provoking others to lust is a very important concern. Because when you wear provocative clothing, you are tempting and stumbling those who are around you. You can make them sin in their mind. You can incite them to lust. You're pouring fuel, as it were, into uh, that fire in their heart that they're seeking really to put out and you're making them liable to fall. Now, we've already got so much of it in our culture. It's all around us. Uh, so much that we have to deal with from day to day. 
It's hard to live in this world and not to be stumbled by everything that we see going on around us. So should we then as believers, should we wear things that are going to stumble each other? Should we say things? Should we do things that would do this? No, our Lord tells us that if we love one another, that we want to make sure that we do what's good, not just for us, but for our neighbor, that we love them and that we try to uh, provoke them not to lust, but rather to love and good deeds. That's what the Lord would have us to do, to have pure thoughts. So basically, this commandment is telling us to have mercy on other people by not contributing to this problem that we have, this sin problem in our society. We need to seek to honor the Lord and be careful how we touch one another, be careful what we say to one another, be careful, you might even say, as far as what perfumes you might wear, but particularly with regard to what you wear. Make sure that you cover yourself. At least you want to say to the point that it will not provoke lust. Now, again, we need to realize this is a two-way street. This is what we do to help our brothers and sisters and, and even those outside the church not to stumble. We don't want to be a cause of sin. We want to be a cause of, well, drawing them to the Lord. We want to love them. But the other end is, how do we protect ourselves from lust because we're, it's all around us and there's really no way to avoid it entirely except, of course, by going out of the world, which is something we're just going to have to wait until it's the Lord's time for us to leave. So what do we do while we're here? Well, we need to remember, again, that immorality, impurity begins in the mind. It starts in the mind as we think about it and as we imagine it, it moves our hearts, and then perhaps it eventually becomes action unless we can stop it. So we need to begin by guarding our minds. We need to guard the gateways to our minds in, in the same way that we saw we can provoke uh, lustful thoughts in other people, we need to guard those same gateways into our own minds. First of all, you need to be careful what you look at. Uh, there's always going to be something around that could possibly provoke you to this kind of, of lust. So you need to be careful what you allow yourself to see. If you know that there's you know, someone or something or some place where this is going to be prominent, you need to avoid it. For instance, you know, what should, should, what should a young man avoid above all else in the summer if he wants to have a pure mind? Well, don't go to the beach because at the beach there's women that are, that are basically 99% without clothing on and that's going to provoke lust, isn't it? And it's inevitable. Uh, be careful what you listen to as far as people saying things that are immoral. Uh, you know, don't, don't listen to those kinds of things. Don't let those ideas be put into your mind. Be careful how you touch, you know, or, or allow yourself to be touched as well. And of course, again, the idea of, of scents and so forth. Uh, if even, an, even a scent causes you to think in those terms, then you need to get that scent out of your mind and out of your nose. You've got to get away from it. Now, what do you do if you've already seen? What do you do if you've already heard? What do you do if you've already been touched, as it were, and, and it's, you know, it's stimulated those hormones or smelled something? Well, you need to try to kill it in your mind, if you can, before it goes much further with your heart. We oftentimes just allow ourselves free reign in those areas where nobody can see in our imaginations. And we allow ourselves to imagine or fantasize about various things, and really, that is sin. If we think about it, if we desire it, I mean, Jesus was telling us if we hate our brother, um, we've murdered him already in our hearts. And I think what he means by that is if we're already imagining killing him, you know, in our hearts, even though we haven't committed the act, we're still breaking the commandment. So we need to make sure we don't allow ourselves to dwell on it. Really, the, the most effective remedy is make sure it doesn't get in your mind to begin with. Make sure that you don't let it enter. But if it's there, you do need to deal with it. 
If it gains control of your mind, it will move your heart and it will produce sinful actions. Now, again, consider 2 Samuel chapter 11. Consider what happened to David. Why did David fall into the sin that he fell into with Bathsheba? Well, there's several factors there. David's army was out to war. He probably should have been out to war with them. Uh, David was walking, perhaps, maybe he was looking for something, we don't know, but he did see something. And that something that he saw tempted him, a woman bathing on the roof. Now, we can only imagine what that might have been like. Uh, maybe she was not properly attired. Maybe, you know, I don't know. I, we don't know exactly what she was wearing. But whatever it was, it was provocative. And if it was provocative, it's something she shouldn't have been doing in a public place, especially where in sight of the king's roof where he could have seen what she was doing. And David, of course, when he saw it, should have turned away. But he didn't. He saw her. He desired her. Being the king, he could send messengers after her. He took her. He committed adultery with her. And the end of it was that he murdered her husband and took her to be his wife. And you know, the child that was born, the Lord even took that child from them, and he would not allow them. And we should, we should also mention the fact that God was merciful to David and Bathsheba. Was Solomon was actually the, the son of Bathsheba. There was, you know, there was forgiveness and mercy. And yet, we also have to take into account what the Lord did to David uh, because of that. The sword, I believe, never left his house. He lost some children because of that. There were consequences as the Lord disciplined him for that sin. Now, don't even begin to think that that same thing could not happen to you. It could happen to you. And so you need to protect yourself. You need to guard the gateway of your mind. You need to make sure you don't allow those things to enter. And if they enter, you need to deal with them decisively right away and not allow them to take hold of your imagination. Because at that point, I think uh, John Owen is correct. Once... Once it gets that far, it's going to be very, very difficult to stop the process from coming to its completion, and that is sinning against the Lord. So protect your mind from those various things that would put the desire, stimulate the desire, stimulate those hormones, and make sure at the same time that you are protecting other people. Remember that you need to guard their purity. Don't become the cause of their lust, but rather provoke love in their hearts. Provoke purity in their hearts. Be an example of, um, well, of what the Lord would have you to be rather than, again, something that would stumble them. The Lord wants you and me to love other people in the things that we do. So let's be careful that we do that, realizing that as we do that, we are also loving the Lord because this is what He wants us to do. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a, in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to, to help us take what we've heard and actually apply this. Again, this is God's truth. This is God's wisdom, and He wants us to do what is good because it is good for us. It's right, and it's also loving to others. So let's receive it in, in that light and seek to do what He would call us to do. Let's, let's bow in a few moments of prayer.